This um, skylight has been put in just for us. It's um, in the wall. You just have those escape windows. Okay. That was. This is was to keep protected these expensive machines here. This is like Blue Peter now. It's one I prepared earlier for you. It's opened out. This is the back of it, and this is the front of it. There is a real one that's been rebuilt. It took 14 years to rebuild it by a group of chaps at the bottom of block B. You've got the chance to go and see it. It actually works. They switch it on. I've tried to do some training on it. It's electromechanical. When it's working, it has a drip tray underneath for oil. It works by electricity and mechanics. When you switch it on, it makes a tremendous din. It's like a one of these old-fashioned knitting machines. It sounds like a knitting machine when you switch it on. There were six of these in this room, down here and down there. Very, very hot and smelly. The oil is always being sprayed out. Two wrens to a machine, they were trained to use it. And a um, GPO mechanic in an RAF uniform, he used to wander about with them. An oil can, doing whatever it is men do with oil cans, but that was he, that's how he kept things going here. All the um, um, switches down the side, and on the back of it here, you've got um, these are 26 plug holes here, 26 letters of the alphabet, and now they are normally plugged across, crossing different. Um, making different circuits. And this is what brought, um, Alan Turing and Gordon Welshman developed between them to find the settings. What it did was it would find the settings of the, um, the three rotors. And one set of stecker letters, it would do that. It worked on the basis of a hypothesis. I can explain it to you like that. Somebody mentioned the weather code books. Um, depending on where the message, this gobbledygook message came from, the magic of the code breakers was to make a guess that somewhere in that message there's this word or this phrase. And you'd set up the machine on the basis of that hypothesis. And when it worked, and the way it was wired up is it would throw out all the, all the connections that were not possible. But if there was an open connection, it would stop. And they would test that stop to see if it was the right setting. If I can explain that to you a, a tiny bit more. Here's a, um, here's a message. Just If you just look at the bottom for a second. It's the gobbledygook message. The real message, it came from a tank unit that was in the North African desert. They had to, every day, send in a, a status report. Not much was happening. So in that message, you could guess that somewhere it's going to say, in, in German, anybody read your German for yeah. me? Can you read it? Yeah. Please. It's really hard, I know, but I just want you to read it in German. Ereignisse. Yeah. So that's the German saying no special occurrences. Okay. So here's your message. You want to guess somewhere in that message it's going to say that. How do you do that? That's called the crib. Or another word is the hypothesis. And I understand uh, the crib. Do you remember I told you that um, a weakness of the enigma is that it cannot encipher the same letter as itself. So, here's your gobbledygook message now, laid out in true Blue Peter style. Here's your hypothesis underneath here. Okay, no special occurrences. You're going to play with this and tell... This won't do, because you've got two O's together, okay? So you play with it a bit until you've not got any letters that are matching each other. This is a very primary school explanation, but it's roughly. Then from that, the guys would make up a wiring diagram. 
with the letters that they thought how they might have matched. They called this a menu. We think Bletchley Park is the first place to use the word menu in terms of technology rather than choosing, you know, egg and bacon or lamb chops. It's funny to think of that, isn't it, where that, where that word came from. The Wrens were trained then to read the menu and to set up the machine on the basis of it. At the front here, here you've got one enigma, one, two, three rotors, okay? one, two, three rotors. You've got 36 enigmas here, okay? What they would do is set each one to a different start position and it took about 20 minutes to run through all those 17,576 possible start positions. Just to, um, of the, you're guessing which rotors though, and you're guessing which position they're in. Okay, so there's a lot of um, magic that goes on here. If you've broken the code yesterday, you know that they're not going to put the rotors in in the same order the next day. So that takes out some of the possibilities. So they would switch it on, the machine would go around, if you've got chance to go and see if they do, if, uh, if it's on. And these three here, that's where the stops come. The wrens would write down the stop positions. It might possibly be how the, the enigma was set up. They call down to the, um, the checking room. They, didn't, they don't know who they're calling. Remember this place is nobody spoke to anybody about their job. Everybody signed the official secret plan on pain of being shot. That's why nobody told these secrets, you know, for 30 odd years. Nobody blogged about them or tweeted or tweeted about them. It's just kept the secret. There's some wonderful stories of people sitting here. You know, I, I had an old couple one day, and this is not the story, sorry, but I'm sure you're interested in this. And I was explaining a little bit about the, because I've done a tiny bit of training. I don't even try to show anybody anymore. And I was trying to just explain a little bit more about the whiteboard. And she said, this little white haired lady with her husband there. And it's not quite like that, dear. And then you know you've got a real person here you know, who really knows stuff. And her husband tried to shush her, you know. The guide's telling you, I said, no, no, please. So you worked here. She said, yes, and the husband looked and he said, you worked here. <laughs> 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 this. But the, the really interesting thing was he said, no, the whole room goes quiet. This marvellous little romantic story is coming out. And the guy said to her, but when did you work here? Mabel. Oh, I can't remember. So she said, between 41 and 44. I worked here. I was in her day. He also was. And they got met, met later and got married. And never told them where they worked in the world. They just did war work. And isn't that amazing? So they sat and found out. Yes, that was wonderful. Everybody loved that. We forgot all about the bomb. <laughs> um, so what would happen is those, the, what the, the settings <coughs> that the bomb had found would be sent down to another room. The Brits had their own code. Um, and ciphering machines, obviously, called Typex machines. You had Typex machines set up to simulate enigmas. You put the, put the settings in that the bomb had found, and then test the message in it. And obviously, if the message is coming out through this process, it's another two hours of work, mind you, it's not instant. But if the message starts to come out in German, you know you've found that network for that day. Because the Enigma codes changed every 24 hours, as, as you know from the code book. So then the events would be called back. The phrase was jobs up. That meant you strip the machine, you put it all back again, and you start with your next menu. Start running it again. Oh, rather <coughs> amazing, wasn't it? The poles, they also had, um, they made a little one themselves, which looked a bit like this. So they had the idea that you could use a machine to try to help them with the enigma, but it was um, Turing and Welshman. Mm -hmm. 
be like a design of this one. Also down at the bottom of block B, there's always got a little cinema, 3D cinema. You can go and put those cute little um, specs on and you can watch in 3D the guys and they explain more technically than you guys, but if you're very interested in that, how the bomb works through its circuit. We've just gone past quarter past, so we didn't start too late, so I'm sorry if I've made you late for your afternoon session, but is there any particular question? Why is it called a bomb? Well, that's interesting. The toll is called it a bomber. And it's um, a bomber is a kind of ice cream in uh, Hold of that. I mean, there's all different stories, really. Nobody quite knows. I like to think of these three young guys, you know, in these little ice cream cafes with coffee, working out interesting things, calling it that. But I don't know. Nobody really knows. But we called it a bomb with an E on the end. It's interesting I should call it that because they were working on different developments for bombs, weren't they? Yes, yeah. And that could have been confusing <laughs> yeah. for politicians. Yeah, well, nobody knew about it. They were a complete secret. After the war, they were all broken up, which is why it took a group of um, men. It has to be men, doesn't it, ladies? Have you yes. ever imagined, say, let's rebuild one of these completely useless machines and spend 14 years in the shed doing it? I think it's marvellous that the Slayer Planet is doing it because uh, we do have a real one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all, <laughs> all the machines, you know, are from this place, apart from two Colossus. They were all broken. The Colossus machines um, were broken up, apart from two that went to what became GCHQ in Germany. You know, Bletchley Park morphed into GCHQ. And the two Colossus machines that were saved um, would so that and what they uh, envisaged was that when the Russians got into Berlin and the Colossus machine, the, um, the Lorenz machine, which was the machine generating this teleprinter cipher, and the Colossus was invented to deal with that, um, they knew that the Russians would start to use the, um, the Lorenz machine, which they did through into the Cold War. And the Brits never told them that they were actually reading Hitler's messages which were sent on this Lorenz machine. So the Colossus attacked GCHQ until about 1961-62. Now we use other means of listening to our allies and otherwise. Anyway. Um, but um, otherwise they were just all smashed up. And to build the Colossus machine, um, Tony Sale, who died just two weeks ago, he, he led the team that rebuilt it. Um, he went to the old post office exchanges that were becoming digital and took all the manual stuff that was um, being thrown out by, by BT because the people who actually built the machines were the post office researchers at Dollis Hill. The, so the, the B, BT people, you know, GPO people there, the, the, the very famous engineer called Tommy Flowers. He was the chap that Turing said, go and um, talk to Tommy Flowers about a machine. And he used valves. He's the first guy to use using valves. But that's the other production line, which we don't have time to go and um, have a look at. But if you come back to Bletchley Park, it's round at the top of the park there, the Colossus um, exhibition. Anything else? Okay, well thank you very much for being so interested. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.